Hi students, welcome to the Baiju Sindhu News Analysis for 17th of November 2018. So let's get started. So let's look into the first article. So the first article says AP West Bengal withdraw general consent to the CBI. So what is the context here? So the Andhra Pradesh government along with the West Bengal government has withdrawn the consent and has revoked its general consent given to the Central Bureau of Investigation to probe all the cases in the state. So what we have to understand is that every state government will have to give its approval, permission or consent in this case to the CBI. Why? So that they are able to conduct all its operations as prescribed to the CBI by the central government which may involve cases of corruption, murder and so on. So this particular article says that the Andhra Pradesh government has revoked it why because of two important reasons so what are these reasons one you have the political angle attached to it that is because there have been certain differences of opinion between the nda government as well as the telugu desham party so because of it that is why andhra pradesh government has revoked it and the second important point that we have to understand is that there has been a black shadow that has been casted on the cbi why because of the corruption charges so the andhra pradesh government feels that because of its political alienation with the NDA as well as because of the corruption charges that have been posted on its director that is why it is withdrawing its consent. What we also have to understand is what is this general consent that this article is speaking about. So the first point that we have to understand is the federal setup. So there is division of powers. So you have the central list, you have the state list as well as the concurrent list. And one such important thing is the law and order. So the law and order in this particular case is the responsibility of the states and CBI is the central organization. So when we say central organization, it is under the control of the central government. So all its powers have been derived from the DSP act of 1946 so what it requires is in case it has to probe any of the offenses or a number of offenses what it requires is the permission from the state government which is posted in section 6 of the 1946 act so what we have to understand in this case is in case the state government does not provide its consent then the CBI will not be able to meddle into the affairs or look into those set of offenses that have been prescribed. So the most important point we also need to consider is there is one of the sections that it speaks about. So what is the section that we are speaking about? It is nothing but section 5. So what is this section 5? So the section 5 of the DSP Act of 1946 gives the central government certain powers to extend the jurisdiction of this particular CBI. So what happens in this case is the minute it extends let's say for example in terms of the domain or for example an offense or a classes of offense it would be able to expand the role of the CBI as well as those agencies that are in the part of the DSP Act. So the CBI traces its origins to this particular conduction but all this comes only to the union territories. So by default the CBI would be able to investigate the charges of corruption on on the central government employees as well as any other murder by default into the union territories but in case it is the state government that it is has to look into then it will require the permissions from the state government as specified in section 6 so the section 6 goes on to say the consent of the state government to exercise of powers and jurisdiction so what does it say nothing contained in the section 5 that is section 5 is about the union territories as well as those provisions that the central government can make shall be deemed to be enable any member of the Delhi special police establishment to exercise powers and jurisdiction in any area a state not being a union territory or railway area without the consent of that state so what is required is it requires approval that provides 
that is provided by the state government. So the most important point is that this general consent has to be given from the state government every now and then. So it can be in the form of months, it can be in the form of years. So there is an agreement and this agreement has to be given by the state government so that the CBI is able to investigate those offenses that are prescribed in section 3. So the section 3 is one which is there in the DSP Act where the central government time and again gives what are those set of cases that the CBI will be able to investigate. So the central government in this case can put up corruption as one of the cases which the CBI can investigate. It can put up murder. So time after time the central government prescribes those cases that the CBI will be able to investigate. So in case there is a particular case that the central government wants it, now it will require the state government consent is what this article goes on to say. There is a small catch here. So what is the catch here? Let's go back to one of the important Supreme Court cases and that is to do with Kazi Lendup Dorji versus the Central Bureau of Investigation and others in the year 1994. So what did the Supreme Court give in this particular judgment? So what it says is that withdrawal of the consent by the state government is only for those cases which can have the prospective approach or the prospective operation. So what do we mean by it? Let's take for example currently the CBI is investigating one of the cases already in Andhra Pradesh. So Andhra Pradesh government will not be able to withdraw the consent that is already being investigated by the CBI that is already taken up by the CBI but only in the future cases in case there is anything then Andhra Pradesh government can block it but if it is already being investigated then Andhra Pradesh government will not be able to block it is what this case has gone on to say so it says that withdrawal of general consent may not have any bearing on the investigating cases as ongoing investigations and filing of charge sheets by the CBI in Andhra Pradesh can be conducted so this is what is being suggested and sold in this this case of Kazi Kendab Dorji versus the Central Bureau of Investigation. So the next question that pops up is, is it happening for the first time? Not actually. So there have been number of instances previously where the state government has not given its consent. Let's go back to the year 1998 in Karnataka. So what happens is you have JH party led Janta Del government. It had withdrawn the consent in 1998 and it had not renewed it for number of years and also in the 70 you had the Devrajaras government even it had not given general permission for the CBI probes so the possible implications that we would be able to see is if the CBI wants to investigate any charges with reference to the corruption or the murder in reference to that particular region that is in this case you have Andhra Pradesh government what they should do is they should get permission on a case to case basis earlier what you had was the general consent so you didn't have to take on a case to case basis so the CBI could encounter and look into all these allegations and they didn't need permission for every single case but now what you see is it requires permission for every case that it is going to encounter in the future and what we also have to understand is this is not a requisite for those cases where the Supreme Court and the High Court will give permission to the CBI so in case there is a corruption charge or there is a murder and this comes from the Supreme Court or the High Court where it has ordered the CBI to look into these cases then the state government will have no role whatsoever. So in this case the general consent or a case to case permission is not required. Why? Because the Supreme Court and the High Court has already given the permission. Except in this case for rest of the things in case the CBI has to go through a particular charge then it will require the permission of the state government. So this is what we need to understand in reference to this article. So moving on let's look into the next article. So the next article says Gaja wreaks havoc in Tamil Nadu. So what is this article all about? So what we are speaking is in reference to Cyclone Gaja. So this was one of the severe cyclonic storm that made a midnight landfall in Vedarangam in Nagaripatnam district. So the most important point is where did it have the landfall? It is in Vedarangam in Nagaripatnam district. So this has been termed as the severe cyclone. Why? Because of its 
wind speeds that are as high as 110 kilometers per hour. So this Gaja is the second major cyclone that we see on the eastern coast after cyclone Titli. So the next important question that prospects in the prelims examination is that who named this as cyclone Gaja? So we have a naming convention and every country in the Indian Ocean belt which are forming the part of the Indian Ocean gives a particular name and this Gaja was actually named by Sri Lanka. So we know for the fact that Titli which was named by Pakistan and Gaja which means elephant is named by Sri Lanka. So what is the next question that pops up? So you have two important questions. One is how is the naming convention? How is every country able to name a particular cyclone? And the next important question that pops up is why is that there are more number of cyclones in Bay of Bengal than in Arabian Sea? For both these questions we have already uploaded a video that is on geography this week in the second edition. So kindly look into it and all your questions will be answered but from this perspective what we have to understand is that the landfall happened in Vedarangam and this is also termed as the severe cyclone why because of the wind speeds that have been as high as 110 kilometers per hour for rest of the naming convention why it happens more in Bay of Bengal kindly visit the earlier recorded sessions so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says unnecessary destabilizing and expensive so what is that we are speaking about what we are speaking about is the submarine so we recently discussed about the nuclear triad and we also discussed that Arihant has become a successful program so what this article goes on to speak about is it a necessity for India to showcase this submarine so this article speaks about the negative aspects and some of the things that we could have controlled so that we could have used the same amount of money on the other aspects so let's Let's start and understand the introduction bit. So what does the introduction go on to say? So what we have to understand is you have the nuclear submarine. So the nuclear submarine has a technological upgradation and it has onboard nuclear reactors which will allow it to operate for a longer duration of time under the water but the earlier problem was you had the diesel submarines so these diesel submarines had these snorkels so these snorkels will require oxygen so they had to come on top of the surface every now and then periodically to recharge its batteries so its snorkels come up and then the enemies would be able to detect that there is a submarine so in order to overcome this issue that is why the nuclear submarines or the nuclear reactors which is on board in the nuclear submarines were invented and when we look into certain background why this submarine became important was this was basically employed during war why because you have certain assets you have the land based assets and you also have the air force in case there is an enemy country which can go on to bombard or destroy the land based missiles and they paralyze the entire air force system then you need another remedy and that remedy was in the form of submarine where they could use these submarines in order to develop a counter strike against the enemy and once they are doing this what the countries used to feel back then is there would be mutual destruction and there will be annihilation of both these countries simultaneously so this was what is being projected initially but what we have to understand in this case is the author goes on to say that this was one of the moves that India could have avoided why first let us try to understand two important terms that this article makes about and then look into all the references the article makes so the first important point that we have to understand is what is this tactical nuclear weapon there are two types of nuclear nuclear weapons one is the strategic the other one is the non-strategic so this non-strategic is also called as the tactical nuclear weapons so what are these non-strategic ones so when you say the non-strategic nuclear weapons these nuclear weapons or the missiles will have smaller yield so when you consider the strategic ones you have a massive yield so when a firing of this strategic one happens you have the destruction of that entire landmass or an entire city because the yield is comparatively more but when we say tactical or the non-strategic ones it is basically used for 
that particular area or a small concentration of that region so that it can act as a tactical weapon so that it can dismantle or disrupt the entire military personnel who are there in that region so the tactical nuclear weapon means it is used for very short term wars and this is not a strategic one which has a maximum yield and the second important point that we also have to understand is it speaks about the cold start doctrine so what is this cold start doctrine so back in 2001 what you had was the attack on the indian parliament so the minute this attack india came up with what is called as the operation parakram so what is this operation parakram so this operation parakram was a mission that was launched by the army to build up forces across the border lines that is on the western area so what they had to do was they wanted to make pakistan bleed economically strategically as well as militarily but the minute operation parakram was initiated there was unfortunately certain problems so what are these problems the major problem was mobilization of the forces became very slow so the military we know for the fact has different regiments and even for the fact there are different controls so bringing up the coordination of all these different regiments became a major blunder and a problem for india and because the time that the troops were able to come and reach the forward deployment zone became a major impediment because they were comparatively slow what was already initiated was a diplomatic move so the moment india started deploying these forces across the border area pakistan had already made sure that it has spoken to usa and what then happened was a diplomatic initiative and india had to somehow control its forces along the western borders but all this was a major impediment and this exposed the major operational gaps in india's offensive strategy so in order to overcome this slow mobilization what india came up was the protocol of cold start doctrine so what is this cold start doctrine so this is basically nothing but a military doctrine which india has come up with where they are able to establish a swift rapid agile as well as immediate retaliatory conventional strike against the pakistan back then when the operation parakram happened we were slow in mobilizing our forces but right now what we have is a rapid movement of the forces across the western borders so this core doctrine is conceived to be a plan that is taken up by the army to attack pakistan immediately within 48 hours of any major provocation back then you had the parliament attack so in case there is anything in the future that pakistan wants to do in case there is any provocation or a terror attack on our leaders on our institutions or anything that can be linked to islamabad what we will do is we will hit them very hard and we also will make sure that certain strategic territories in pakistan are occupied so that we can minimize this as a nuclear war so what this cold doctrine basically does is it is a quick fire response to the enemy action that is the pakistan is the enemy here so we are mobilizing our forces immediately abruptly swiftly and rapidly so that we are able to control their forces and we are able to stop the nuclear war from happening so what this article here goes on to say is that because of the cold start doctrine that india has initiated that pakistan is disturbing us threatening us that we will be using tactical nuclear weapons but what this article says is even if the tactical weapons are employed this will not be a problem to india even if there is a problem it will be restricted to that particular area where india need not have to worry why because it can hit back pakistan after this particular move so india didn't have to come up this particular submarine process is what this article says and apart from this it also takes the picture of china as well china has one of the important conditions and that conditions is almost similar to india so what is this condition it has a condition that it will not be employing its nuclear missiles on a first strike so it has no first use policy as similar to india let's take for example in future cases in case there is some disturbance and even if china wants to move away from this particular principle and deploys its missile against india or against this no first use policy what could be the problem is even china could sense the devastation why because even united states of america which has 
large such a large arsenal of nuclear missiles is kind of reluctant against the small north korean country because it knows the devastation of what a nuclear catastrophe can strike but india has more number of missiles under its armory so china would be very serious and it will be very cautious in case it has to move away from its no first use policy so on one side you have pakistan which we would be able to control and the other side china will also be cautious in case it is wanting to take on india so these are the two things that it goes on to say and apart from this it has also voiced certain other concerns so what are the concerns it speaks about traditionally what you have is all these weapons and the nuclear missiles is under the control of the civilian government but currently because of this submarines what you will see is the control is under the processing of the person who is controlling the submarine so there have been said that there are certain permissions that has to be taken and there are certain switches like the permissive action links which can be set up but the problem is it is still under the control of those people and this is moving away from the civilian control of the nuclear missiles and the third important point that it speaks about is in reference to the cost so what does it speak about the cost what it says is conventionally what we have is these submarines and these submarines are very costly though we do not know what's the cost of the arihant but assuming the international standards according to uk and also united states of america the average production cost of this is almost up to 70000 crores for a single submarine so apart from the cost of production this will require certain maintenance and the maintenance of these classes will require almost up to 2000 to 5000 crores on an annual basis so assuming that india's production is comparatively cheaper what india is spending here is it is spending almost a mammoth 3 lakhs crores for a 40 year life cycle so what this article goes on to speak here is you have pakistan and china which can be a problem but they know for the fact india also has missiles and india also has counter measures so they will avoid it second point it speaks about is the control moving away from the civilian process that is the elected government process and now it is under the control of the military or that particular submarine which has taken up the initiative of firing the missile and the third thing that it speaks about is the cost so spending so much almost as 3 lakh crores for its production as well as its maintain cannot be taken up by india why because you have number of people who do not have the basic food they do not have the shelter they do not have the education they do not have the health measurements but we are spending on all these nuclear submarines which could have been used for all these type of social economic development so what this article basically goes on to say is india could have been avoiding this particular move why because it could have used the same money to some other socio economic development so this is what this article all about so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says a crippling shortage so what is this article we did discuss everything about the vacancies in the subordinate judiciary yesterday and we also looked into the number of statistical evidences we also discussed the case study where the supreme court has given some of the guidelines for the state government to accomplish and also the concerns that have been voiced in the cases but what this article goes on to speak about is justice delayed is justice denied so what is it it gives certain reformations so what are the reformations it speaks about what this article goes on to say is we know for the fact from according to the constitution the district judges are appointed by the governor and this happens in consultation with the high court and other subordinate judicial officers officers are appointed as per the rules that have been framed by the governor and this happens in consultation with the high court as well as the state public service commission so what this article goes on to suggest is that the high court should be able to give its consultation on a faster basis so that more number of people are employed and this employment will reduce the pendency of the cases and apart from this what we also need is an administrative machinery for which what you need is the manpower as well as the resources so it also asks the state government to provide suitable number of people apart from the judicial officers so that they 
they are able to employ these manpower as well as the resources so that the number of pending cases can actually be reduced why because judiciary believes that the more the number of years it takes for a person to finish off his particular case it means the justice delayed is justice denied so the common person who is actually crippling with the financial resources who is working and believing in the judicial process will have a lot of problems why because of his poor judicial delay so this is what this article goes on to say but the background for this is already explained in yesterday's cna so kindly look into it so moving on let's look into some of the prelims practice questions which of the following countries have longest borders with india you have china Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh. So we will have to arrange them in the decreasing order. So the answer for this is 4, 1, 2, 3. So let's look into the explanation. So you have Bangladesh which has the highest border then followed by China, Pakistan, Nepal, Myanmar, Bhutan and Afghanistan. So in order to remember these countries we have one of the important codes and the code is Bachpan. If you can remember your childhood, if you can remember this word Bachpan, then this question will be easy to solve in case something pops up in your future endeavors. So the next important question is from the previous year question papers. Consider the following countries, China, France, India, Israel, Pakistan, which among the above are nuclear weapon state as recognized by the Treaty of Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, commonly called as Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So this treaty identifies and recognizes only two countries that is China and France the other three countries are not recognized so the answer for this is one and two only so moving on let's look into the next question it says Willers Guslain recently seen in news is in it is in France why are we discussing this it is because of recently happened World War One hundredth year that is why this was in prominence with reference to France that is why this is being discussed so the next mains practice question is ship submersible ballistic nuclear submarine program of India is a white elephant critically analyzed so we have already discussed this and we have already discussed the advantages part of the nuclear triad in our earlier CNS so you'll have to make sure you're balancing this answer giving the advantages as well as the disadvantages so please write all your answers on the comment section so that we can have a peer review and we can also have an evaluation from the Baiju's team as well so there are other important articles that is to do with the economy and all these important concepts from the economy will be discussed on our economy weekly module so kindly look into the economy weekly module as well so this is it for today thank you so much all the best